Welcome to the Angerati studio at European Utility Week in 2015. We uh, today have a panel of experts uh, with us to discuss microgrids and what the future of microgrids will look like. We're going to discuss some of the challenges and talk about some of the, the different ways that we might get there. So joining me today are Angelo, Mike, Remy, and Peter. And I'm gonna, we're going to go around and I'm just going to ask you to first introduce yourself and who you're with. Uh, your role and how you're looking at microgrids, just briefly, and then we'll jump into some of the topics. My name is uh, uh, Angelo Movo, and, uh, and uh, I work uh, uh, for uh, Veritas, that is uh, a company, a municipality company, multi service company, and uh, its core business uh, is uh, uh, water, the distribution of uh, water and uh, the treatment of uh, wastewater and uh, the collect and the treatment of uh, waste, municipality waste. And we have a little division that uh, uh, build and realize uh, PV plant, cogeneration plant and, uh, and uh, biomass plant. And uh, now we are uh, building, uh, implementing and, uh, and, and a little microgrid an experimental little microgrid in, uh, in Venice, in, in, in the of Venice. Thanks so much. I'm Mike Wilkes, I'm a director at EY in the Global Power and Utilities Advisory Practice and I lead work for clients on networks and smart energy. So I cover quite a wide remit as you can imagine and for me microgrids is part of the whole story of a sector and transformation. It's an extension of the smart grids at the really local level. Uh, for us, it's, you know, it's really about the sector changing from what it's traditionally um, been used to to something radically different. Hi, my name is Rémi Garod, working for ERDF, French DSO. And in ERDF, I'm working as a project manager and I'm coordinating the grid for You project, which is probably one of the biggest uh, smart grid projects in Europe. And in grid for You we are doing two microgrids one in the Czech Republic and uh, one in France in Nice. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter van Slijf from uh, Alliander. I work at the Corporate Strategy Department and my main focus for the past couple of years has been uh, how to look in the development of decentralized energy system, particularly from a market perspective uh, and looking into ways of how do we as DSO can integrate this into existing markets uh, in a way that helps all uh, parties involved, the customers, but also conventional energy companies. Great, excellent. So we have um, a really nice cross-section here to discuss this topic. This is a, a challenging topic, I find, um, for a variety of reasons. It, it impacts uh, the utility business model, it's a variety of customers, there's even some you know, a lot of technical and standards challenges. At the same time, across the world, we're seeing a, a huge upsurge in projects. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the projects are very custom. Custom technologies, uh, uh, interconnection challenges that don't always stay the same, depending on where you're building, the microgrid size, what the microgrid might look like to the grid, I mean, all kinds of technology challenges. Um, regarding macro grid disruption. And at the same time, it's really the key to a resilient grid. And in also the developing world, quite important. So this is a, a broad, difficult topic. And, and I, so I just sort of want to get your, your opening opinion on um, you know, what you see as the, as the most important challenges now between where we are today with, with, with microgrids and where we want to be tomorrow and, and what that trajectory, that pathway is going to look like. Angelo, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, look, my opinion is uh, that uh, the, the most challenge uh, actually uh, is uh, the uh, electronic control and the uh, software and uh, IoT technology uh, for the microgrid because uh, the, I think that uh, uh, for the point of view of uh, the electrical connection, uh, the grid has no problem to connect uh, all the microgrid and all the PV generator. Uh, but uh, uh, there is uh, today a problem of, uh, of control and of uh, distributed control. 
and also if uh, we have a control by a uh, network, uh, the network has to have to be uh, inside of its microgrid and uh, this represents a, a critical point for the security of the control of the grid because uh, actually the grid is controlled only for one station uh, that is the DSO, the distributor but uh, in the next time uh, the grid uh, have to exchange uh, information with the microgrid and so right. we have uh, uh, a very critical point. Uh, this. Right, so I hear you saying a lot of the technology pieces are there but there are the, some of the challenges are more related to communications and the interplay between the macro and the microgrid. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Mike? Yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, I think uh, when we talk about microgrids, we're still in that ver very early innovation phase where people are trying out different technical solutions. There's lots of different innovators with different ideas as to how that might fit together. We have the component parts, as Angelo said. You know, we, storage technology is becoming much more economic. Solar technology is already very economic. It's about how we fit those jigsaw pieces together. And I think at this point, we're looking at the technical solution, but very quickly, we're going to hit the, the regulatory issues and the customer deployment issues that follow on from that. Right. Well, I, I think that's a really important point, which is the economic issue. So the, when you start moving into you know high penetration renewables microgrids, then you have uh, intermittency challenges. How much battery do you need? And this is why I think we end up with some of the high degree of customization. Uh, what do you think? Well, of course, I just you mentioned the technologies, techniques are almost available. We, we know how to create microgrid some, somewhere. The idea for utility and uh, my, my opinion on the, if you look at the European the distribution grid, we don't really uh, need a, a microgrid as there is an existing grid which is uh, efficient, resilient. But we do believe in ERDF that microgrid could be probably the best solution to provide electricity to the 1.6 billion of people who are living without electricity somewhere in the world. If they wait for uh, the traditional grid, transmission grid, distribution grid, to have electricity, it will be really much expensive and will take a lot of time. For these people, microgrid could be a very good solution. And thanks to the standardization, at the end, we could say that there will be several microgrid, and then we will start to connect them from micro to, to from microgrid to microgrid. But for uh, at the European perspective, and especially in France, the grid is strong enough to welcome the renewables. And we don't think that to move from the connected grid to the microgrid could be, uh, at least on an economical perspective, a good, uh, a good thing. So uh, that's interesting. So you're talking about the issue of using microgrid technology to treat energy poverty issues, which are extensive. And so in a funny way, we, what we do in the developed world is some, sometimes quite informed by some of the projects and also remote microgrids and uh, military applications. Yep. Uh, so it, it, tell us a little bit about your perspective, Peter. Uh, I, I think indeed you have to separate, first of all, the microgrid developments and the drivers there in the developed world, like in Europe and North America, which is more focused on end customers uh, grouping together in local energy collectives, wanting to get control within their own local area, their own neighborhood, that they're sure they're going to use renewable electricity or their own electricity, which is more of a societal development with increasing amounts of renewables. And on the other hand, uh, indeed, the developing world where microgrids can really help getting people first-time access to electricity in a cost-effective way. And uh, while we have the disadvantage in some ways in Europe and North America that we have a very good and reliable and cost-effective grid to compete with for microgrid solutions. Right, right, right. In uh, Africa, you have cost-effective solutions right now. We right now have, I think, uh, five to ten microgrids operational in Africa in several countries together with local uh, grid operators or local entrepreneurs. And we're actually using this knowledge to look into how can this impact our business with the large connected grids in Europe in the coming 10 to 15 years. Right. Uh, and I think we can 
in the end learn more about microgrids developments in Africa, in the, uh, how does this work in Europe in 10, 15 years time, in the way that mobile payments in Africa uh, took the continent by storm and only now contactless mobile payment is beginning to, uh, to come within Europe. So and that's yes. the reason that we're separating the European developments, where it's more focused on interoperability with the existing grids and market infrastructures. That's why we developed a, uh, a framework for, together with uh, other utilities and technology providers called USEF. It was, by the way, launched yesterday in a webinar. Yeah, well, and yeah, this is it's a very interesting point uh, that I'm hearing here. So, you know, I, am, I live in the United States and the microgrid projects are just as you described. And it's, a, it's an important difference. It's come up quite a few times just during the show in the various interviews I've done, which is how do we take what we've learned in North America here, and is it even appropriate? And it sounds like it's it's not a good fit for a lot of ways. There's the grid strength, and the, the issues that I'm hearing here, the learnings, the innovations, and the breakthroughs regarding microgrids, not the component technology, not necessarily the interconnection, not harmonic disturbance, but uh, the business models that yep. will work to support these things. So in the United States, uh, you know, we might find a, a big box store installing their own microgrid to run their own operations. Uh, in New York, where I'm from, there is a lot of financing available now for community microgrids, so a neighborhood gets together and has their own uh, solar array or some battery backup, but this is very different. So let's talk about some of the use cases that are, that are most important to you, and uh, let's start with you, Mike. Well, I think there's a diversity of drivers. So at a very simple level, you could think about developing markets where you're trying to you know, electrify remote regions. Same principles apply to remote sites, even in places like Australia, where you're at mineral extraction or military sites where you're needing resilience and security. And often those are remote, isolated microgrids. But I think one of the interesting developments we're seeing in America and in Europe, actually, are integrated microgrids where there's still that tie to the traditional infrastructure but the consumer maybe because they want to go green maybe because they want to have control are taking more ownership of the, the value chain at a very local level and only using the grid for maybe a security or supply purpose rather than a traditional energy delivery as a purpose. backup system so the role i think yeah. in europe is, is is changing and it's an extension of smart grids in a way but to a much smaller envelope yeah so that's a very disruptive model actually yeah. so angelo do you agree that yes, that's the yes, case sir. that's important i think that uh, this uh, uh, it's a difference uh, from uh, africa or from uh, Because uh, in Europe uh, we, we have the infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, we have to connect uh, the micro grid to the existing grid and uh, we have, uh, have an, an interchange of energy from the micro grid and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the big grid and uh, if uh, uh, I think that in the next time uh, the micro grid have to the road and uh, the, the, the grid, the actual grid, uh, have uh, a role uh, of uh, the emergency uh, network and uh, of uh, and integrating the, the energy supplier uh, for the, the consumer, uh, for the customer. Right, so this is, it is a, you know, it's all, it's considered in some places the microgrid is, is an existential challenge to the utility business model. But I, I, I find have to be. It, yeah, but I'm, so let's talk about that. Can it, I would love to hear what you two gentlemen have to say about that. So as a, as a challenge to the prevailing model in Europe, especially, of course, because we're here, tell me, tell me what that looks like. Is it an existential challenge? And if it's, if it's not, what is it? Is the challenge is that if we consider that the people want to be more active, on the, the local electricity grid or local electricity market, 
we have several options to offer them more and more power in this market. If we want to change the governance a bit of the local electricity grid, we can do that. If we want to run an area, an electric way, uh, as much as autonomous as much as possible, we can do that as well. The main difference in what we, uh, we, we are not 100% for is that even if we develop and we use microbit technologies, microbit uh, techniques and microbit governance, we don't really have to open the breaker and to make yeah. this area fully uh, disconnected from the existing strong and reliable grid. We can uh, develop everything and keeping this area connected to the grid. And it will be exactly the same. People will move from consumer to prosumer. They will have voice for the local governance of the grid. But the breaker will still be uh, closed and we will run the, the grid as we run it in a very efficient way. The resiliency could be better, but we don't have to open the breaker. I think it's, it's, it could be a pity to kind of opening the breaker to kind of destroy the grid. We, we invest a lot to, to, to make it uh, as reliable as it is. I see. And Peter, what do you think about that, huh? that, that business model shift to uh, disruption? Do you see it that way? Uh, it will certainly shift our business model, but rather than consider microgrids as an existential, existential threat, I think it could, be, uh, it could be the savior for the existing utilities to a certain extent. Because the alternative would be either a completely centralized connected grid with 200 million prosumers trading on a national market meant for a couple of thousand big uh, electricity retail and production companies which let's face it if you develop the system for about 100 actors and you try to fit 200 million people in it it's gonna crash microgrids can separate this issue by creating several sub-national markets and thereby keeping the present national energy market systems and rules uh, operational within the total context and keeping the system as a whole stable. And I think the only alternative would be that either you're part of the grid connected system all across Europe and then we have to fundamentally redesign the rules of what is the European power market or with the pre uh, decreasing cost of solar panels and storage in 10, 15 years time, a lot of households in Europe will say good luck with your grid, I'm completely self-sufficient, I don't need this grid defection. And then we're faced with several hundred billion euros of stranded assets at least in Europe. So you're talking about grid defection. You're talking, this is very interesting if I'm yeah. understanding you, you're talking about a tension that is not often talked about. So where uh, microgrids may actually be the answer to dealing with massive uh, small scale grid defection. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Prosumers, active customers, something that is, is being pushed forward from both European consumer organizations uh, but also the European Commission that want a much more active role of the end user, both as a producer or a customer of, uh, of energy, in this European renewable energy transition. Okay. Um, and these microgrids, uh, if the trading and the interaction there is working good and the threshold to access these markets uh, is good and there's, there's a trust, for all the parties involved and it's interoperable with the national systems then you can save both parts of the equation yep. and in my opinion the only alternative to national energy markets and microgrids is that all domestic customers are gonna uh, go off grid within the next 15 20 years yeah, this might be great the, in, in, in saving energy the electron, by the way right? yep. So let's talk about the economics a little bit. So I, I, I believe what you're saying is true. In my mind, that makes a lot of sense, even from the North American perspective, that you know, economically it changes the value of an electron if you're producing it mm -hmm. on your roof. And But I have never heard this discussion, really, to the extent you're talking about. So um, 
what do, what do the rest of you think about um, what Peter is saying here in terms of the economic model? Does this make sense to you? Yeah. Mike, go ahead. So um, uh, we at EY, we've done a global study looking at the economics of microgrids worldwide. And that's showing that on a pure commercial basis, it actually can deliver major benefits to commercial and industrial users, never mind domestic users. Um, but I, I come back to Peter's point, if you, have, if you have a degree of connection with the traditional infrastructure, you get the best of both worlds. They get their control, they get their greener energy, they save some of the loss of energy from large generation flowing all the way through the system. So there. then you're saving a lot on infrastructure. But when the sun's not shining and the wind's yeah. not blowing and the storage has run out, you've still got that backup capability. So I think it represents a change of business model for the utilities, but it's not a threat. It's an opportunity to change and actually expand some of the things that they do today for the consumer and at the same time, sorry, no, no. for consumers to much more easily engage, as Peter says, with the wider system through a sort of a, a, a staged ecosystem of, of so, connections. Remy, I have to ask you, how do you feel about being referred to as a backup system? I mean, is that, I mean, what, is that what does that do? For TSO, like, like the EFD is not to be natural to think like that. <laughs> A local connected grid that makes sense yeah. local yeah. connected grid in this place this area could be if if we do need it could be a marketplace as well to avoid right. yeah. to a market which could be too big and, and, and impossible for us to, 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 to manage but I'm 100% sure that we need to keep the, the, the connection we don't have to, to, to open the breaker we don't have to go on the to let places go on the whole. There is no added value. And uh, we are doing microgrid in the, in the grid for you project in Nice. Well, we are able to island an area for five hours or more than five hours only with the batteries and the solar panel without any uh, other uh, generation uh, process. It's, uh, we did it to fully understand what a microgrid is. And trust me, it's not expensive and it's really, really complex. If you want to island the area, open the breaker without any black start. For the consumers, right. they, they, don't, they don't see anything from connected to islanded and back to connected without any black start. It's really difficult, really expensive. Even if all it is the, very all expensive. All the equipment yeah. technology. Yeah. Yeah. Equipments yeah. are available. Yeah. We are working with Alstom, with Saft, with all the very good, are making great equipment. It's really complex, really expensive, and so far, in the Nisbet project in the Czech Republic, the, the demo in the Czech Republic, so far we don't have seen uh, the, the added value. Mm -hmm. In terms of resiliency, in terms of efficiency, and of course in terms of, of finance, that's definitely not, not, not clear, and uh, there is the cost-benefit analysis is definitely on the wrong side. Right, so we just have a few minutes left, but this has been a very interesting and enlightening conversation for me because um, what I'm hearing is that, from Angelo that and others, is that we're, we're, we're comfortable with the actual discrete technology pieces. We're not quite comfortable yet with um, that putting them all together and integrating them. Maybe the standards aren't there, the interconnection's not right, the, the basic issues of balancing the grid. But I'm also hearing a very, very positive perspective on on um, it not being so, not being an existential threat, which is how often microgrids are considered. And I also really appreciate the perspective on uh, using microgrid technology to deal with the extreme energy poverty issues. I very much agree. And so a, a nice positive conversation. And thanks so much for your time. Uh, this is Carol Stimmel in the uh, Andrade studio at European Utility Week 2015. Thanks again.